Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, everyone, uh, it'd be great if you could just put your uh, speakers onto mute and we won't get any background noise. Um, thank you very much indeed for joining this session on why use tutors. We're delighted that schools, trusts and local authorities across East Anglia have discussed working in partnership to do their best to lever into the region as much resources as possible and work together on effective use of this uh, new opportunity. My name's Tim Coulson and Mark Rowland and Andy Samways are going to be leading uh, this half hour session uh, with me. This partnership is for trusts, for schools, wherever they are, and the two research schools in East Anglia that have been accredited for a further period. We hope you'll want to be part of this partnership. Uh, as you've signed up for this session, we'll include you on further communication as more details become available from the Department for Education. What did you think when you first heard about the billion pound catch-up funding? Many people I've spoken to have said the best people to help children catch up will be the staff at our school. The best use of additional funding for my school will be additional small group interventions for the children who've fallen further behind. Well, the money for your school from the 650 million pounds, heads can decide how to spend this. We hopefully will know shortly how much this will be for each school. But there's another 350 million pounds, some of which schools can access in addition to their own additional money if they choose to put a bit of their additional money into tutoring. Schools will be able to access heavily subsidised tutoring from an approved list of tuition partners. We want this partnership to lever into the region more funding that can help our children. We know that tutor agencies work in all parts of the country, but are particularly strong in metropolitan areas. We wish those areas well, but our job is to make sure children in our region get their share of the resources on offer. The aim of schools partnership tutors is to make sure that if a school uses a tutor, this leads to children making progress. The National Tutoring Programme is a government funded sector led initiative to support schools address the impact of COVID-19 school closures on pupils learning by providing additional support. The programme has two aspects, NTP partners and NTP coaches. NTP coaches are where trained graduates will be employed by schools in the most disadvantaged areas to provide intensive catch up. Our proposal focuses on the NTP partners, but if any school should be involved in NTP coaches, these graduates could be offered training and support too. The guidance so far available says that NTP partners will provide high quality, subsidised tutoring in schools. This tutoring will be delivered by tutoring organisations with pupils being provided for, for example, one hour of tutoring per week for a course of 12 to 15 weeks. The tutoring will be provided by trained tutors who are external to the school. For schools that want their tutors to be the most effective possible, the Norwich and Unity Research Schools are offering to provide training for tutors that schools choose to use. We have approached the Department for Education and the Endowment Education Foundation about a proposal also to collaborate across the region on establishing a tutor agency where schools involved can recommend tutors to be used. All tutors can be trained on evidence-based approaches and schools can contribute to the way an agency provides tutors to schools. Schools will direct this programme. So tutoring is linked to their curriculum and to complement their catch-up programme. The invitation to you is to join a group of schools that are determined to make the National Tutor Programme make a difference for their children. 
Of the additional funding to your school, every £1,000 committed by a school buys £4,000 of tutoring. £10,000 buys £40,000 of tutoring. You may know just the right people you would want to use as tutors. You could employ them directly, or if you go through a tutor agency, you can have four times as much of their time. We don't want using tutors to be hit and miss. The ambition of this proposed tutor agency is that tutors are trained in the evidence of what makes an effective tutor. If they want to be a tutor with this group of schools, they can't just take their money. They have to commit to being as effective as possible. The first stage of this is signing up for a free two hour session on being an effective tutor. You are welcome to encourage those you hope will be involved to sign up for training being offered on Wednesday, Friday and Saturday this week. It's my privilege to introduce Mark Rowland, who is going to draw on evidence and practice to talk how about how best to use tutors. Mark works with schools, local authorities and trusts right across the country and with the Department for Education, particularly on raising standards of disadvantaged children. Mark. Uh, th thank you, Tim. Good, good morning, everybody. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm going to talk for a few minutes around the evidence base um, and some do's and don'ts around uh, most effective uh, approaches around t tutoring. I'm not going to patronise you on a Monday uh, morning by reading this uh, slide to you, but the details there and that really backs up uh, the introduction that Tim has done. Could you go to the next slide, uh, and, Andy? I just want to refer you to an, a, a new study from my colleagues uh, from the colleagues at, at Impact Ed, uh, Owen Carter and his team here, they're just producing a longitudinal study looking at actually what the evidence tells us uh, is happening to pupils uh, in terms of their uh, educational outcomes and their well-being as a result of the pandemic. And I think it's really, really important principle right through this process that our, that our any tutoring that we do uh, our strategies informed by a, uh, assessment, not assumptions that were rooted in evidence rather than sort of guesswork around what people need uh, might be. It's a super, super report, it's an interim report, uh, but I really, really commend it to you. Some really interesting findings uh, in there. Um, not least this point, well, so uh, what, what Owen's team are finding is that across those 50,000 pupils that they're looking at, that pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds have been disproportionately impacted um, and found the greatest challenges. Also those that have special educational needs have found some of the greatest challenges. Um, but those interestingly aren't attributable in the most part to ICT, but rather around space, exercise, support from teachers, support from families, routine and relationships. Um, so those are interesting themselves. Also, what's been very interesting coming out of that study is the impact on mental health and physical well-being. And what Owen's team have found is that there isn't a uniform decline over those first uh, three months, uh, first two to three months in, 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 in the study. Um, but rather, it's quite individual, the impact of that. And there isn't a marked uh, decline. There's an impact, but it's around small numbers of pupils rather than perhaps being at the levels that we might have anticipated first up. And I think that is interesting itself, um, that actually we can't be making assumptions about pupils. And what Owen's team are offering there uh, through that report is a diagnostic assessment for individual schools, because our pupils in our own schools aren't the pupils that he's studying in his research uh, re report. So I thoroughly, thoroughly commend uh, that to you. The other point I think is really important to make here is that we need to remember that our disadvantaged pupils in particular uh, didn't have a level playing field before the coronavirus pandemic. It, yeah, there already, it, there really wasn't a, a level playing field for those children and there were significant challenges within the system that we were addressing well in some cases, but also and, and not so well in others. So um, this offer, I think, uh, has more potential than just actually addressing the acute needs as a result of the, the, the coronavirus pandemic. There's something in the long term uh, that we can uh, that we can be addressing there too. Thank you, uh, Andy. So, this is uh, uh, the Education Endowment Foundation toolkit. Uh, uh, the average effect sizes that we see 
as a result of different types of sort of ed educational interventions. And, and, and I recognize this is, you know, this is a meta, meta analysis. So it's a long way from, you know, phonics on a wet Tuesday, you know, in, 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 in June. But nevertheless, what it does give us some indications around what best bets are. And it's really, really pertinent to an evidence-based approach to tutoring um, and tuition. Because if we look at those things that on average have the biggest effect sizes, they are things that we'd want to see in an evidence-based uh, tuition uh, program you know, across the phases. So feedback around improving the learner, around self-regulated learning. In small group uh, tutoring, peer, there would be a peer tutoring uh, model. Early, you know, early intervention and early years intervention is going to be absolutely critical if we're not going to see a real legacy around sort of COVID and children's learning. The homework element in secondary, one-to-one -one collaborative learning, or language, those kinds of things, even down to digital technology and social emotional aspects, is a really, really strong evidence around what the best bets are that would underpin an evidence-based uh, approach to tuition. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andy. But evidence can't tell us, you know, um, you know as, as, as schools, what to do. It can guide us and it can inform us alongside our professional judgment and our knowledge of, 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 of context. Um, so here are um, the evidence summaries for small group tuition, one-to-one -one tuition. And then what I've also linked to there is a, a website called Evidence for Impact, which tells us about particular approaches to tuition and the evidence base that sits behind it. Those are phase specific, subject specific as well. And I'd really, really encourage you to sort of dip, uh, dip into those and have a look at, because they will help make sure that actually any tuition, they'll help guide thinking around any tuition offer and make sure that it's really specific uh, to pupil need. And the bottom link, I mean, I thoroughly commend Greg Brooks' work uh, around children with literacy difficulties for anybody working in education, but actually I think it's very pertinent to uh, what we're trying to address here, because actually, I'm sorry though, those of you who hear me talk about this before, and I'm sorry to sound like a clanging gong, but you know, there's no golden ticket around addressing these issues, but literacy is the closest one that we've got, and in particular, children's oral language, which you know, if we don't get that right, you know, it's such a limiting factor on pupil, uh, pupils' future uh, attainment. You know, poor language is an anchor on future attainment. So if we address that, um, we give pupils a much better chance of success right across, uh, right across the, the curriculum. And I think the tuition model really offers a chance for pupils to develop that uh, language. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. So, yeah, I mean, there's the point again that uh, you know, around evidence, it can form our judgments, it can support our judgments, but actually um, school leaders, professional experience you know, uh, and, and, and value should also underpin that uh, too. We should be informed rather than led uh, by the research evidence. Thank you, Andy. So I've just compiled a few sort of do's and don'ts that can uh, help, that will they'll certainly inform our offer but hopefully they will help you with your own decision make, make, making uh, as well. So, in, I mean, some of these are self-explanatory, but of course we need to be rooting our approach. If we're going to have an impact on learning that have a, a evidence of impact on our target group of pupils, which is why, again, clearly identified need is critical. Um, need, not assumptions, need, not labels. We need to be uh, driven by. Tuition at all times needs to supplement high quality teaching rather than be a replacement uh, for it. If, it. if it's a replacement for it, any gains that the pupils have will be built, uh, will be built on sand. If those tuition gains are to be sustained, uh, the approach needs to be rooted in improving the learner rather than individual test scores yeah, within a pre and post uh, test offer. And that's the self-regulated learning ele element of, of, of the tuition, I think, and building up pupils' background knowledge as well to make learning stick better in, in class. So this is an opportunity to help pupils become more effective learners. And alongside that, teachers need to be empowered by the offer. You know, this can be particularly helpful with pupils with poor attendance, particularly with poor attendance related to attitudinal issues, but even if it's to do with physical uh, sort of health uh, issues, because actually we know that poor attendance you know, can make teaching in the classroom you know, increasingly difficult. So actually this is an, offer, uh, this is an opportunity for sort of a pre-teach model 
here to enable pupils to experience a better, uh, you know, a better offer when they're in class. So it needs to empower teachers rather than, um, rather than disempower. And again, here's the point around uh, driven by assessments, not, uh, not, not assumptions, consolidation, pre-teach. Um, I'd argue time and time again, I think the evidence supports uh, what, I, what, what I'm saying uh, here, is uh, that achievement and independence in the classroom you know, it, it, it is fundamental to whether this uh, approach has worked or, or not. We can't, again, just rely on pre or post tests to tell us because actually the true measure of success is whether the learning gains are sustained when pupils are back uh, in class. And that links to the point around evaluation that activity taking, tuition taking place is not impact. We need to evaluate whether those gains are sustained back in class. Thank you, Andy. And here's uh, the don'ts. Tuition on its own isn't going to solve uh, all, all of these challenges and we really, really need to take a long-term approach to address this. You know, the, the, the evidence tells us that the impact will be significant for some pupils and uh, uh, an Owens report is bearing that out around a, re a number of other sort of evidence reviews. But again, the point that actually many of our disadvantaged pupils weren't doing as well as we like them to already. Um, we mustn't have a tuition offer that's looking for pupils. It should be the other way uh, around. We should be driven by pupil need rather than actually uh, th those labels or assumptions. And we need to be really, really wary of, of isolating pupils and intentionally, nobody do that intentionally, but actually, you know, are pupils being constantly withdrawn from say their foundation subject lessons um, to attend tuition? The experiences of those pupils through their lens needs to be considered there and I think the importance of pupil voice is really 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 critical uh, here because I'd sort of lean towards Graham Nuttall's book The Hidden Lives of Learners uh, here and what we might be assuming pupils are experiencing when they're going to tuition and what they are seeing uh, the purpose of that is might be something very very different I think there's a wonderful line in his book that says no matter how we explain things to pupils they'll they'll find a thousand different ways of misinterpreting it so we need to be explicitly clear to pupils about why we're asking them to engage uh, with tuition. Similarly with parents, this isn't because they're poor and haven't done enough work during lockdown. It needs to be around, we need to offer you this tuition to help you to catch up to do better in your lessons. So this is part of the curriculum uh, and a part of the offer that we're making uh, to, to, to you. And linked to that, the feedback loop between teacher, pupil, uh, and tutor is absolutely critical. There's a communication there. And, th and, 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 and it won't always be smooth. So it needs to be a sort of constant dialogue uh, through the group. Self-esteem, people's self-confidence is tackled by those experiences, people's experiencing tuition and then building on those gains back in the classroom. Otherwise, again, that, um, uh, that, that, that the confidence from the small group will be built on, on, on sand. And um, be really clear, the final point uh, I want to make is that we need to be clear about defining what does success look like on pupils before we enter into that uh, process. So we rigorously uh, uh, evaluate whether it's made the difference that we'd like it uh, to. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Mark. Andy. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark. Uh, the final element of today's briefing is from me, Andy Samways, Director of Unity Research School. Unity and Norwich Research School are two of the 40 strong network of research schools established by the Education Endowment Foundation. The EEF has one overriding purpose to, ev to use evidence of what works in schools to improve teaching and learning, especially for the most disadvantaged. The research schools network aims to bring to lead the way in which the use of evidence is used in evidence-based teaching, building affiliations with large numbers of schools in our region, supporting the use of evidence at scale. We know there's no quick fix to meaningful school improvement. Mark mentioned that just a minute ago. And we work with schools in the region on three things really. One, encouraging schools to make use of evidence-based programmes and practices through regular communication events. Secondly, providing training and professional development for senior leaders, teachers, TAs, on how to improve classroom practice based on the best available evidence. And that's something I'll just hint to uh, elaborate on in a moment. And finally, supporting schools to develop innovative ways of improving teaching and learning and provide them with the expertise to evaluate their impact 
once again, as Mark was talking there about evaluating the impact from the outset. With this in mind, we're committing to supporting tutor and coach development over the coming months. An initial repeated training session takes place this week on Wednesday, after, Wednesday evening, Friday afternoon and Saturday morning. These free online sessions are aimed at supporting those who may wish to consider the role of tutor or coach to help make their work alongside pupils in our schools the most impactful it can be. In the first session, we're introducing a number of key essentials as outlined here. How do pupils understand, learn and retain ideas? Starting to explore those aspects. As Mark has said, really honing in and starting to plant the seed about the importance of literacy and what teachers, TAs and now coaches and, and tutors can do practically to support oracy and the accumulation of, of language. What are the building blocks to support numeracy? One of the key parts there is the considering how the home learning can actually be pushed on now to support the parents as well as anything else in understanding the, the mechanisms used. And as Marcus said, how can interaction support pupil self-regulation? If this is to work in the long term, we have to boost this, the, the strength of learning within our pupils. We'll be drawing on high quality, trusted and freely available evidence utilising the EES guidance report. Their recommendations support high quality, effective practice. Essential aspects of pupils learning, including literacy and numeracy from early years through to secondary school will be utilised in blended online and self-study opportunities. The EES COVID-19 resources are also providers with additional resources to support the development of highly effective tutor and coaches. If you haven't seen them yet, the support these bottom two on the right here, support resources for schools. There's a wealth of resources that were developed across the network uh, to support over this time. And also these resources to share with parents, some really, really useful pieces about supporting reading at home, for example. I commend those to you. But they'll be the kind of pieces that we're utilising. Alongside the literacy and the numeracy focus just mentioned, the guidance reports provide a wealth of further recommendations, particularly pertinent to the role of tutoring. Supporting pupils in the development of positive learning behaviours is a crucial aspect of effective tutoring. If tutors are able to support and inspire stronger relationships to learning for pupils, then the impact of their work will significantly add to all that teachers in our schools are striving to achieve. Within our training provision, we'll be drawing on key recommendations associated with parental engagement, send, behaviour, social and emotional learning, as well as metacognition and self-regulating. The latter in particular provides clear strategies with strong evidence that when employed effectively, have the capacity to boost progress by up to five months. And a, and a highly practical evidence-informed example of this we'll be exploring in the first session is this. It's drawn from making best use of TAs. This simple scaffolding framework seeks to encourage greater pupil independence through least help first. Prompting, cluing and modelling are all powerful tools within the toolkit of highly effective teachers, TAs and tutors. And it's this piece of the work around supporting least help first rather than correcting and providing answers to begin with. We want to support people in understanding how as a tutor they can be employing such either remotely or in person prompts, clues and modelling. This modelling we feel is a really, really important aspect of what the tutor will be doing. We believe we can add value to the professional development associated with the National Tutoring Programme and are looking forward to evolving through collaboration support available for schools and tutors in the region. We hope you found this short briefing um, useful. It hope, we hope it's provided the opportunity to find out more about our collaborative ambition to make the very best of the opportunity provided by the National Tutoring Programme to our pupils, families and schools in the coming months. We'll be sure to keep you posted, as Tim said, as we ourselves find out more and our plans evolve further. Please do encourage potential tutors to register for our free training this week. Should you have any ideas or questions, you can contact us via email. Thank you for joining us this morning. We wish you all the best for the day and I hope it's a productive one. Thank you very much. Goodbye.